we've been going through a series looking at the life of David. David, we meet him as a little boy, and he's chosen way ahead of his time to be the king of Israel. Just a little guy, maybe 11, 10 years old. And uh, we, we follow his journey through as he learns to be a warrior, learns to be a leader, and then the tables turn on him. He then finds himself being pursued by the present king, the king who has um, become jealous and envious of the fact that he, having not done the job well, is now being re- going to be replaced by David. And so David is pursued into these valleys, and David has this huge level of integrity, because when the opportunity came to kill the king, he didn't take the opportunity. He said, no, far be it from me to touch God's anointed king. But in time, as we saw last week, David becomes the king. And now he's in a position where um, he's the boss. Now, the whole world changes when you're the boss. We all have aspirations of what we'll be like when we're the boss, if we ever get to be the boss. But here he is in this position of command. Now he has all authority, literally all authority on heaven, uh, from heaven on earth. He's the anointed king. He, at his command, people can be uh, chosen for life or chosen for death. So what does he do with his time? And last week we looked at how it was that he, um, David, in this time of peace that Israel was experienced, experiencing, he decided that he would build a temple for the Ark of the Covenant, this, uh, this beautiful gold box that represented the power and the presence of God. God said that he would inhabit this ark, this, this ark of the covenant. And David in his home, which he said was beautiful and uh, lined with cedar wood, and he looked outside and he saw that there was the ark of the covenant still in a tent. And he goes, that's just not good enough, eh? That's just not acceptable. And so he says to the prophet Nathan, he says, look, I've got this idea. Um, I'm going to go and build a temple for the ark of the covenant to reside in. And Nathan the prophet goes, yeah, that's cool. Do whatever you want to do, because whatever you do, you always get it right. You're the anointed king. And that night, God comes and speaks to Nathan the prophet, and he says, you tell David that I don't want him to build me a temple. I've been freely going with the people of Israel as they've gone through the desert. I don't need a temple. I don't need a place to reside. And... uh, And so you think, okay, that's cool. That's the end of the story. But it's not. Because what happens then is God tells Nathan the prophet to go back to David and says, because you wanted to build me a temple, I'm going to build for you something even greater. I'm going to build a legacy for your family that is going to go on for eternity. And your name and your family's name is going to be remembered by all mankind for all of history. And, and, and David is just absolutely blown away by this. And we looked last week at how it was that um, David's genealogy, his whakapapa, uh took him right through. His, it's his bloodline that finds itself in the person of Jesus. 28 generations later. 28 generations later. Okay? It's an amazing story, isn't it? And here we are, 3,000 years later, still talking about David, celebrating his life and the way that he wanted to live his life and worship God and put God first. And so God says, you look after me, you think you can look after me, but even greater, I'll look after you. And I think this changed David's life significantly. Because when we come to grips with the way that God sees us and how we are perceived by him, that just just a game changer, isn't it? It changes our view of the world because you don't have to believe the lies that the world is telling you when you know who you are in Christ. Is that fair to say? If your confidence and your identity is in Christ, people can put all sorts of labels on you, but it makes no difference at all because you know who you are and that's what counts. And so when we talk about a commitment to grace, who has the greatest commitment to grace? God has the greatest commitment to grace. And it's up to us to catch up with what God has already done. Because God only has one plan to rescue humanity, and that is through the covenant of grace. No other way. There's no way which we can earn favor with God, is there? We can't do the dishes twice. We can't 
put the rubbish bin out every week just to please mum and dad. That might be a good thing to do, but we're not going to earn favour with God because God is holy and he cannot be approached on our terms. God made a way for us through the death of his son, Jesus. And so a commitment to grace is God's plan. Dr. Charles Stanley, well-known American preacher, um, talked about a time when he was at university and he was sitting an exam set by a lecturer uh, at the college and as they went in as students to sit this exam, the examiner said, the lecturer said, I want you to read the exam thoroughly from cover to cover through to the end before you begin answering the questions. And so with this, the students did. And they got to the end and they started looking at each other, you know, sideways glances. Because the final comment on the exam paper said, if you hand this exam paper to the table, to the teacher, untouched, you'll get an A+. Plus. And so one brave soul walked up and put the exam paper on the lecturer's desk and wandered off, and some others did and some others did. And then there were those who were furiously writing because they hadn't listened to the instructions. Okay, that'd probably be me. Listening to instructions. And then there were those who saw the final instruction but didn't want to accept that it was a gift. And they wanted to prove to the lecturer that they were actually worthy of a mark that they generated themselves. Of course, they didn't get an A+. But the reason why the lecturer did this, Dr. Stanley said, is to prove that this covenant of grace, and this is an example of it, means that we can't achieve it on our own. The A plus is credited to, credited to us by grace. It's a free gift. We can't earn it in our own strength. And so when David heard these words, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Uh, these words would have penetrated his soul, penetrated his spirit, and given him tremendous confidence in who he is in God. These are game changers. These are life changers. These are things that when they come to us by revelation into our heart, they will change the way that we look at ourselves. And when you change the way you look at yourself, your whole world changes around you. Is that fair to say? But it's by revelation, this gift of love, this gift of grace. And let's see how it is that this rolls out, how this continues in David's life, because I think it's a, it's a real game changer for David and how he starts to treat other people around him now has, uh, uh, has changed forever. So let's have a look at how this story rolls out. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. So David's just reflecting back to God going, hey, 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 I um, I tried to do something for you. Now you're doing this for me. Um, Why this favor? Why this this grace on my family? I'm just a human. Because David's all about glorifying God. He's all about glorifying the divine. And God says, well, yeah, that's cool, but I'm going to glorify in you. I'm going to make your name great. And David's response is, but I'm just a human. What have me and my family done? We haven't done anything to deserve this. And God would say to him, that's the point. That's the point. What you have done is loved me. You have honored me. You can't return favor to me. You can't reward me. Even the attempt to build me a temple is not going to win the favor. And so I can only imagine, and maybe I'm projecting a little bit here upon King David's life, but as he would have wandered around and maybe one night just sitting out amongst the campfire, he would have started figuring out about this grace and how it was that he he had so much favor upon him. And he would have started reflecting on his own life in the times when there were troubles. Troubles when David was under pressure himself, and he had a really, really close friendship with a guy called Jonathan. King Saul was trying to kill him. Jonathan, King Saul's son, was David's friend. So it was a real conundrum going on here. You had the the father of his best friend trying to kill him, and Jonathan saying, hey, look, um, I love you like a brother. I love you like a brother. 
and I can see that you're going to be the next king. I won't be the next king, said Jonathan. You will be. And I love you like a brother. But listen, when you find yourself as the king, can you look after me, look after my family? And and they make a covenant together, a covenant to choose to look out for one another. And this is how this little covenant is made a couple of chapters back. It says, But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. This is Jonathan talking to David. And do not ever cut off from your, off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan, Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. And then a few verses on it says, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. So they separate ways here. This relationship, this covenant that we looked at a few weeks ago, that describes a beautiful friendship between these two men, these two young men who'd fought in battle together, And yet here they were now saying goodbye, and Jonathan knows there's something in the wind. He knows that his family doesn't have the blessing of God upon them anymore. And so he's saying, listen, uh, be it me or my children or my children's children, would you look after them? Would you look after them? And so we we project forward back to this campfire, and what we find is that um, David must have been thinking about this covenant, Do you find yourself when you have times of peace and times of quiet and times of reflection that you're sitting there and you're going, you know what, I said to myself, I said to my friend that I'd catch up with him. You know, wow, time's been so busy. I need to make good that promise, yeah? Well, here's David thinking in similar terms. He's just been blessed. He's just been blessed by God in a way that is just mind-blowing, heart-changing, because he now knows that he's a child of God and nothing will ever change that. And so sitting around this campfire, he now begins a process to keep faith with the covenant that he made with his friend Jonathan. It says this, David asked, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Zebra answered, He is at the house of Mekur, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Now let me just unpack this a bit for you. David's saying, where's Jonathan's family? Because I made a covenant with this household to look after his family. Even though Jonathan died in battle with his father Saul, I made a covenant. What was traditional in the day is that when a new king came into any country, the old king's family fled. Because if you didn't flee, the chances are you'd be put to the sword. That was just the the nature of the game in those days. There's no evidence to suggest that David had done this, but because of tradition, because of fear, um, Saul's family just disappeared off the scene. But we've got this one family member now left. His name is Mephibosheth, and he's lame in both feet. And for us, when we hear this story, we think, wow, this this is a picture of pity. You know, this guy's been abandoned by his family. He has no one whom he can call family to look after him. And so he finds himself now in this lame state. And how did he get in this lame state? It was through the, um, the misadventure of his nurse. It says here, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. That was when they were killed. And his nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. Okay, so here's the story. This is why the guy's lame, because his family were now were fleeing out of fear for the fact that this new king was going to be there. Now, 
Again, no evidence to suggest that David killed the family, but they were all in fear and they ran and you can only imagine something going on, maybe going down some stairs or, or crossing a ditch or something, this little five-year-old under the arm of the nurse and, and somehow in her panic she dropped him and now he was lame in both his feet. Maybe he couldn't even walk at all. Chances are he couldn't because if he could have, he would have stumbled his way out of Israel like the rest of his family, rest of his whanau. But the story doesn't end there because he ends up in the company of a man called Emil and at a place called Lodabar. And that place literally means a place of no pasture, a wasteland, a place of desolation, a place of isolation, a place of low or no productivity, a place where you're lonely and you're separated, a place where no one wants to go because it's just that, a place that produces nothing. So why would you set up your crops there? Why would you farm there? It's just an, a place that is sad and abandoned. And yet here's this sad and abandoned young boy, this young man there. And, and he would have been feeling very, very sorry for himself, as you would expect. He would have thought, man, all my family have disappeared. Did they live? Did they survive? Did they get killed? Have they been accepted by uh, the neighboring towns and villages and other tribes and other parts of the, of the nations around them? Or have they all been put to the sword? He wouldn't have known But David now is after him, wants to talk with him. And it says here, this is what happened. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Micah, son of Emil. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. We can only imagine what was going through this poor guy's mind, you know. It's like, is David finally caught up with the only fam- family member that he can find? Is this payback time for all the times that my grandfather Saul pursued him and, and humiliated him and embarrassed him and mocked him and told lies about him? Is this payback for, for me? Am I going to be the one who's going to, the last thing I'll hear is the of the sword as it comes down across the back of my head. These were the things that would have been going through Mephibosheth's mind when he heard that one word, his name, being called out. It was just a point of identity, Mephibosheth. That's all David said. And he thought, here goes. As soon as he identifies himself, his destiny is going to be secured. At your service, he replied. And then David said this. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. You will always eat at my table. Hold on. What? What did you just say? I'm Mephibosheth. I'm from Low Debar. I'm from the place of isolation. I'm the cripple. I'm the one whose family persecuted you. I'm the guy with no future, no hope, and you've just said, what? You're giving me my grandfather's lands? You're restoring that to my name? And you're now inviting me to eat at the king's table? Something dramatic has just changed here. This is a change of fortune for this young man. And David said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mephibosheth. Don't be afraid anymore. And Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? This guy wasn't being humble. This is the way he saw himself. When you live in a wasteland and you're a cripple with no family, no means of support, you are as good as a dead dog, just waiting for your last feed, which doesn't come and then you die. This is how he saw himself. But he is echoing something here that we looked at before with David when David said to God, who am I and who am my family that you should care for me in this way? David is overwhelmed. 
David is in awe of the grace of God and it has affected his life. It's become a game changer for him. And now he's starting to reproduce this in his own life. Because once your identity has been changed and you understand who you are in God, your life changes in the way that you treat other people start to change because your value is not based around what other people think of you. Your value is based around whom God says you are. And David, your name will be eternal. And so David's response is say, I'm going to make good on my promises as well. And let me find a family member of my great friend Jonathan. And they do, and he's a cripple. He's, a, he's a, an outcast in society. And David says, I will raise him up. I will raise him up. And this is a surprising grace for us as we read it. It's a surprising grace for Mephibosheth as he experiences it. But let's have a look at how the story unfolds itself, because the summary is just something amazing. It says here, Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops, so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Can you see the summary here? There's a two for one going on. The very end, the postscript, tells us the way the world remembered him, the way the world identified him. You know Mephibosheth? You know Saul's grandson? You know Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth? The guy who's lame? Oh, yeah, yeah, we know him. Where's he living? He's living in Lodabar, out in the wasteland. Oh, in the wasteland. Oh, I suppose that's understandable. You know, he's sort of outcast now. He's a reject. He's the guy with the broken legs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one who's the nurse dropped them when they were fleeing town. Oh, yeah, I remember that. He's the one with the broken legs? Mephibosheth. Yeah, I know the one. And yet twice in this passage of Scripture, it says, this is the guy who now eats at the king's table. This is the guy whose life has been transformed by a grace that gave, was given to him by David after David had received a grace from God himself. A grace that said, your name will be great. And David says, I can live with that. That will change who I am. Now I'm going to make grace available to others. And so Mephibosheth is no longer defined by his crippled feet. He's no longer remembered as the guy who had broken legs. He's the guy now who eats at the king's table. He sits with the king's sons. He discusses the king's business. He understands the king's world. He's now part of the royal family. His whole identity has been changed. And we have to see ourselves as the Mephibosheths of 2016 because the world wants to put a postscript on you that says you're the one who's had a lame education You're the one who has a lame business. You're the one who has a lame marriage. You're the one who has lame parents. You're the one who has a lame socioeconomic background. You're the one who has lame looks. You're the one who has a lame car, live in a lame address. You're the one who has a lame identity because you can't see yourselves bigger than the labels that have been put on you. And God says, no, no, you eat at my table. You deserve to be about the business of the king. You're the one who sits with the sons and the daughters of the king because I have called you by name through the death of my son Jesus, the outpouring of grace and the labels that the world will put on you, which call you lame, no longer count. They no longer count because that's not the way God sees you. That's not the way his son set this thing up so that he would die for you and see you as who you think you are because of the labels other people have put on you. You don't live in the wasteland. You you now dine at the king's table. Is that good news? It's good news. It's the good news because it's the gospel news. 
And once the gospel news permeates your heart and your understanding, you get out of bed in the morning and you don't put on the labels of the world. You get out of bed in your, of the morning and you say, I am a daughter of the Most High God. I am the son of the Most High God. I eat at the king's table. I get about each day the Lord's business. I'm part of the discussion with the family, with my brothers and sisters around the king's table, and no, no hell or high water can ever come into that room and pull me off that table. And like Mephibosheth, some of you have got to the king's table purely and only, well, all of us, by grace. You see, Mephibosheth is every chance that he couldn't even walk. So somebody would have lifted him up and put him at the seat. That's grace. He can't even claim to have got to the table on his own. Grace says that God will lift you and put you at the table because this is where you belong to be. And don't let the world rob your identity. Don't let the world rob your confidence. Don't let the world tell you lies that the lies that tell you about you being lame. These lies in themselves about you being lame are, are, are just Absolute rubbish that is spoken over you every day. Every television commercial you see tells you you're not, so you should be. Every time somebody wants to raise themselves up, they will diminish you. Every time you feel that you're not worth of some, worthy of something, God is saying to you, hey, you eat at the king's table. And the problem is, we forget. That's it. We forget. We forget who we are. We forget our identity. We forget our place and our position. And we allow what the world thinks of us to define us. My friends, this picture of grace is grace because it blows our mind. You're sitting there going, ah, king's table? Really? Me? Yep. It's you. The free gift of grace. And if, and if any of you have never discovered this, if any of you have never realized that this is whom you are, then you need to get a new identity. You need to invite Christ into your life. And recognize that this forgiveness that he offers, this grace that he gives, can never be taken away. Because just like David's covenant with Jonathan, it was a covenant that could never be broken. Just like God's covenant through his son Jesus, it can never be broken. It's all weighted one way and it's in your favor and it's in my favor. And that's why it's called grace. I just want to ask the music team to come out now. And uh, we're going to finish here. But um, by way of um, acknowledging how easy it is to remove ourselves from the king's table, I'm just going to ask you to do something this morning as we play this last song. We're just going to uh, get, I'm just going to get music, musicians to play the first verse. And uh, if you've realized... That, that label lame, you've allowed it to define you in some way. And you need to get back to the king's table. I just want you to stand as the music begins and just allow yourself to be ministered to by the Spirit and just say, God, rename me. Rename me. Take away that label. And then after a, a few moments, Colin will ask us all to stand together. But just let this be an opportunity for you to just say, God, yeah, I've, I've forgotten who I am. I've forgotten that I'm a child of the Most High God. I've forgotten that I dine at your table. That's where I belong.